Would you join me in a time of prayer? Our Father, you are the giver of life. All good gifts come from thee. And without your grace, without your mercy, without your love and your providential care, we would be without hope. Thus we worship you, especially in the Christmas season as we remember you're sending your son, born of the Virgin Mary, who would live a sinless life and be a sacrifice for our sins and then be raised victorious to eternal life, inviting all of us by faith to be raised with him. We thank you for these blessed truths and the difference that they make in our lives how they bring hope, how they bring joy, how they bring meaning. We also this morning remember the faculty and the principal at Popular Springs Drive Elementary School. We pray your blessings upon Lavanda, Germany, principal there and dear friend. And all the faculty that are there and the workers, we pray that during this Christmas break, their minds and their hearts will be refreshed and renewed in the joy of the season. And all the students that during this time and this season, that they'll know of your blessings. And for those students who are in situations where there's great struggle, we pray that the Prince of Peace will begin to reign. And that when school returns, that as they're taught to read and to write and arithmetic, that they'll also be taught by example by their principal, by their teachers, of how to walk by faith. We also remember this morning our sister congregation, the First Baptist Church of Collinsville, who just a short while ago, they lost their building in a storm. But it helps to remind us that a church is not a building. A church is not a location. A church is a people, a people called of God to be together, to serve, and to worship. And First Baptist Collinsville is building a new building, but they are a people, not a building. We pray your continued blessing upon them and upon uh, Wade Ricks, their pastor and staff, and that they, during this Christmas season, as they worship you, that you will bless their lives. Forgive us, Father, for how we fail you. Teach us every day as, to, as we live that we can indeed walk by faith and not by sight. For it's in the blessed name of our Savior Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. Thank you, Nina. And I, and I, know, I know exactly what you're talking about, about... You're having your heart broken. I was in high school, and, a, and my girlfriend broke up with me, and and I was and I was devastated. It was right before the senior prom. We had been dating for several years, and I was depressed and discouraged, and and I actually got went to school to Hattiesburg to get away from her, and um, you know what I ended up doing? I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. <laughs> I never get over telling that. I just. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the 61st chapter of the book of Isaiah. And the Psalms is the middle of the Bible, and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and then there's Isaiah and Jeremiah. Say what you want to about the commercialization and the secularization of Christmas. This one fact is unavoidable. That on December the 25th, the world practically comes to a halt because of the birth of a baby. And whether that's why people are stopping and slowing down or not, it doesn't matter. The world practically comes to a halt because Jesus was born. 
Yet we have to work to keep Christmas, to keep the Christmas story from being swallowed by traditions and legends. We have to work at remembering what it's really all about. Matter of fact, to prove that little fact, I'm going to give you a quiz. Now, you braved the elements, came out to church today, and your reward is you're going to get a test. It's eight questions, multiple guess. Number one, Joseph was born in what town? A, Jerusalem, B, Bethlehem, C, Nazareth, D, Decab. <laughs> he was born probably in Nazareth, C, Joseph. Not Jesus, Joseph, though his ancestral home was Bethlehem. Question two, who told Mary and Joseph to go to Bethlehem? Caesar, Herod, Mary's mother, or no one? No one did. There was a decree that had been issued, but as far as we know from what the text tells us, no one went up to Joseph and said, you've got to go to Bethlehem. He may have figured it out on his own. Number three, what did the innkeeper tell Mary and Joseph? There's no room in the inn. You can stay in the stable. Both of the above are none of the above. none of the above. In the biblical record, the innkeeper never says anything. The narrator of the story says they went to Bethlehem and there was no room in the inn. And, uh, but in order to dramatize the story, Christmas dramas always include an innkeeper and the famous line, be gone, there's no room in the inn is, is used. But it's not in the scripture. It's never said. Okay, number four. How you doing on this quiz? You going to pass? <laughs> Trick question, yeah. Number four. How did Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem? Number one, a colt. Number two, Joseph walked while Mary rode a donkey. Number three, Uber. <laughs> or number four, who knows? The Bible doesn't say. Just, who knows? We, we don't know how they got there. Tradition says he walked and she was on a donkey or a colt. But we, we don't know. They could have been in a wagon. Uh, we, we have no idea how they got there. It's not that far. It's no farther than from here to Marion. But if you're having to walk, it's a pretty good, pretty good journey. So we don't really know. And the text doesn't indulge us with that. Number five. Who arrived at the birth scene first? A, the wise men. B, the shepherds. C, the pizza delivery guy. Or D, A and B, the wise men and the shepherds arrived, arrived together. It is B, the shepherds. The wise men and the shepherds were never there at the same time. Never. Um, the folks who run the library for us at Highland, we have a big display window that where the library looks over the hall. And every year they put out their Christmas display. It's a manger scene. And it's Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, and the animals, and the shepherds at the manger. And then over here to the side are the wise men. And, and, and he always added a note that said, and later. <laughs> it always bothered him that they were together. They were never there at the same time. Number six, how many angels spoke to the shepherds? Shepherds. One, a multitude, a host, or three? What? Only one spoke to them. Now there was a host, <laughs> but only one spoke to them. Trick question, right? All right, number seven. What song did the angel sing to the shepherds? Joy to the world, glory to the newborn king, Mary, did you know, or none of the above? Well, that's right, and they did sing, but they didn't sing to the shepherds. They sang to God the Father. So, and we don't know what they sang. Okay, last question, number eight. The wise men came to Jesus and he was, A, in a stable line of major wrapped in swaddling clothes, B, in a castle, C, at a house, or D, at the Holiday Inn Express. 
was in a house. The text says they were in a house by that time. Jesus was at least three years old by the time the wise men got there. He was at, le he was at least three years old by the time the wise men got there. He wasn't a baby. Now you see, you have to work to keep the story straight and to keep the myth and legend out of it. But the story is significant. But for most of us, Christmas is a combination of two things. It's a combination of memories and feelings. Sad well, and sprinkled with a few facts. Sadly, some people have very few happy memories associated with Christmas. Over the years, I've known some people like that. And so Christmas is not something they look forward to. Christmas is something they get through. For others, the, it's the memory of one bad event that happened on or near Christmas that cast a shadow over every Christmas. We got news yesterday that my Aunt Mildred uh, in Tampa, Florida, she was my dad's youngest brother's wife. She is right near death. She's under hospice care, not expected to live but maybe a few days. Uh, Mildred had a little boy named Brent who uh, I never knew, but he was hit by a car and killed right near Christmas. And Mildred was always sad. I can remember Aunt Mildred always being sad at Christmas. That one event cast a shadow over every Christmas. And then there are some people who all they have are wonderful memories of celebrations and gifts and familyness, and that's what they have for Christmas. But all of us bring a combination of these things. We have memories and then feelings associated with the memories and then a smattering of facts about what Christmas is all about. But what I want you to realize is that underneath the memories and the feelings, there still remains a central event rooted in history. Something that actually happened in time and space. An event that took place with real people on the earth. Though we may have a hard time reaching back to the actual event, we have a record of it inspired by God and preserved over the ages that tells us a baby was born, a child was born, as the prophet said. For unto you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord is born. That's the heart of it. The heart of Christmas is the person. The heart of Christmas is Jesus. If you have your Bibles, I want you to look with me in Acts 61. And I want to read the first um, four verses, I think it is. I can't remember my text. What did I say? Acts, I am, I live in a state of confusion. I just want y'all to know that. Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4, and verses 8 through 11. This is the Word of God. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins, they will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. And then verse 8. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and the burnt offerings. And I will faithfully give them their recompense and make an everlasting covenant with them. Then their offspring will be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples all who see them will recognize them 
because they are the offspring whom the Lord has blessed. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the Lord, as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as the garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. This text is a prophecy. Now, you have to understand something about Old Testament prophecy, especially the what's called classical prophecy or the prophets of the 8th century B.C., of which Isaiah is the prince. He's the king of the prophets, uh, the better known and best known. The prophets spoke, first of all, of things immediate, things right around them. And they spoke to power. So they spoke to the ruling kings. Isaiah spoke to ruling kings. And he would make prophecies about things that were going to happen within their lifetimes. And then sometimes the prophet would speak of something that would be way off in Israel's future. As Isaiah will do. Isaiah first and half of the book speaks to things that are happening right then, right now, with the kings he is dealing with. And then beginning with chapter 40, he begins talking about things centuries to come when the children of Israel are in captivity in Babylon under the punishment of God. This is what is happening here in these verses we've read. Isaiah is talking about things that are generations removed. Words of hope. Words of how God is completing that punishment of them and how he's going to do something wonderful among them. And then sometimes the prophet is speaking about something that's even further into the future than that. This is one of those times where the prophet is speaking about something that's not in his lifetime, but it's in a few generations ahead, but it's even more than that. It's about something when the Messiah comes. We see this verified when Jesus arrives at his home synagogue. If you look with me in Luke chapter 4, Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 4. Jesus goes to his home synagogue in Nazareth. Now he's begun his earthly ministry. He's been through his, the temptation. He's called his disciples. And he returns to Galilee and he goes to the hometown of Nazareth. And he goes to his hometown synagogue. And there as is the practice in synagogue worship, scripture is read. And an adult male would be selected to read the scripture. And maybe because Jesus was home and they all knew him as Mary's boy, they decided, well, Mary's boy's home. Let's ask him to read. He was selected to read scripture. Then he would get to choose from the scrolls what he would choose, what he would read. He chose the scroll of Isaiah. Isaiah is large enough. It was one scroll. And he would pull that scroll out and he chose this text. He chose Isaiah 61, the first two verses. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Then Luke says, He closed the book gave it back to the attendant and sat down and all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. I need to make a comment about this. When he sat down, it doesn't mean he went back to his pew. There would be a seat up on the platform, a raised platform, and upon that seat the rabbi or the teacher would sit, the one with authority. He presumed to sit in that chair. He sat in that chair and everyone staring at him, that chair was the seat of authority. 
And from that chair, he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. They didn't like that. Matthew account of this, they rose up and tried to kill him. They didn't like it at all. But Jesus understood. He understood that these words of Isaiah from long ago were for a generation or two removed from Isaiah who were in captivity in Babylon, but it was more than that. It was about him. Notice the text says at the very beginning, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. Anointment has a rich history in the Old Testament. They would anoint people with oil because they were sick. So they, they felt it had healing qualities and that it was a spiritual blessing. They would anoint people as a part of worship. Again, as the idea of it was a blessing of the Spirit upon them. They would anoint people at special ceremonies. They would anoint the dead. But they would anoint people who were selected to do special things for the Lord. Mothers would bring their children to be dedicated to the Lord and the babies would be anointed. And then sometimes a child would be brought forward, brought forward like Samuel was and Samson was where the parents are dedicating that, Lord to the ser that child to the service of the Lord. And to symbolize that, there would be an anointing with oil. I don't like the idea of having grease poured over my head. Honestly, I don't, but and I've never done it. Well, actually, I did once. I was in a band, and we did 50s music, and we would grease our hair. And it would take days to get the stuff out of there. But it was significant. He claims the anointment. God has anointed him. Anointed him to do what? He lists five things. Bring good news to the afflicted. To bind the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty for captives. Freedoms for prisoners. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And to comfort those who mourn. Changing their ashes to the oil of gladness. Instead of mourning, a mantle of praise. Instead, instead of fainting, transforming them into oaks of righteousness planted by the Lord himself. This is what he says God the Father has sent him to do. It's a tall order. Tall order for anyone. Matter of fact, you look at this and think about it, it's a work only God could accomplish. I think it's significant, Nina, that you talked about a friend who was broken. Because this is one of the unique things that Christianity brings to the world. In every other worldview that I know of and have studied, brokenness is a sign of things were, are wrong or you're cursed or there is no meaning to it. But not from a Christian worldview. Jesus says, blessed are they that are, they're mourn. In a Christian worldview, brokenness has dignity. And the dignity is that in our brokenness, God meets us in deeply significant ways, whereas we may never know them when we feel whole. In our Christian faith, there's dignity brought to brokenness. And we hear this expressed. The broken exiles, they've brought hope. They've brought the new sense of purpose from the Lord. And then for us, as we come to faith in Christ, our brokenness is healed in Him. It is healed by faith. He speaks of the favorable year of the Lord. You know, we need a favorable year, don't we? I've observed this in my 17 years in Meridian, that we're always on the tail end of whatever is happening economically in the country. The country enters into a recovery, and then we're kind of on the tail end of it. We need, <laughs> we need that recovery. We need a favorable year of the Lord. We need His favor to shine upon us. There was a movie that came out in 2002 name of the movie is Antoine Fisher. 
I doubt any of you have seen it, but if you get a chance to see it, you ought to see it. It's a really good movie. The movie is based, it's a true story, and it's based on the story, on, on, a, on a biography written by Anton Fisher called Finding Fish where he tells his life story. It was turned into a screenplay. Denzel Washington, you know, the black actor, uh, he got a hold of that. He's the producer and director of the film, and he helped star in it. And uh, it is an incredible story of a young man who was born in prison. His mother was a crack addict. His father was shot and killed by another girlfriend. He was taken from his mother after he was born and put in foster care. He ends up in a foster home where he is sexually and physically and emotionally abused. He was told that his mother's going to come for him one day when she gets out of jail. But then his foster mother would tell him, said, no, no, no mother would want you. You're not worth anything. And would tell him how sorry he was and how no one wanted him. And she would constantly refer to him with the N-word. As soon as he was old enough, he left that home. He joined the Navy. As you can imagine, though, that young man had a lot of anger and hurt deep within him, and it kept coming out in an angry burst. He kept fighting. So eventually he was told he had to go see the base psychologist. The base psychologist is played by uh, Denzel Washington. An incredible performance, who has his own brokenness in his life. And he and Antoine connect on a very deep level. And he tells Antoine, you must go find out about your family. Because Antoine says he has no nothing, nobody. He does have a girlfriend now, though. And she goes with him. They go to Cleveland. In Cleveland, they get a phone book and they start calling everyone with the last name of Fisher. And so they're calling hundreds of people. And they've been calling and calling and finally he calls this woman and she answers the phone and asks if she knew her Antoine's dad and, and she goes, yes. And he explains, well, I'm his son. And she says, then I'm your auntie. And her husband's his uncle. And the next day they meet. Antoine goes and his girlfriend go to their house. And as they're talking, he talks about his mother and he assumes she's dead. And his uncle said, oh no, she's not dead. She just lives a little, a little ways from here in the projects. Do you want to meet her? And Antoine says, yes. So he warns him that this may not be a very pleasant visit. And they go and knock on the door in a dirty, filthy project. And she opens the door and, and she's been so out in coke all her life, she almost has no emotional response. And then the uncle tells her that this is her son that she had in prison. And she stares at Antoine and then she turns and walks out of the kitchen into the living room dirty, rotten, broken furniture. Antoine follows her. He sits and he begins asking her, why didn't you ever come for me? Why, why did you not even look for me? Did you not know that there was a boy somewhere who desperately wanted his mother? And all she could do was smoke a cigarette and big tears come down her cheek. The actress who does this role is incredible. Finally, Antoine gets up and he does something beautiful. He walks over and he tenderly kisses her on the cheek. And the kiss clearly communicates that he forgives her. And then he leaves. He and his uncle are walking back to the car and Antoine's pretty despondent because, you know, he found his mother but she's really not worth a whole lot. There's never going to be anything there. And he's once again feeling that I have no one in the world. I'm all alone. They get back to his uncle's house. And they open the door. And the house is full of family. 
cousins and aunts and uncles that he never knew existed, little children, adults his age and older. The kids are holding cartoon drawn signs that say, Welcome home, Antoine. And he walks in and one by one they come up to him and greet him and welcome him. And he goes over to the dining room and there's a table covered with food. Every good food you could imagine is on that table. And sitting on the other side of the table is this real elderly African American woman. And she pounds on the table and everybody gets real quiet. And she signals for Antoine to come over. And he goes around the table to her. She's nearly blind. She reaches up and she feels his face. And then she smiles and she says, Welcome home. I get emotional every time I think about that film. It is a beautiful film, a beautiful story. And it tells something that only God can do, and that is to take our brokenness and dignify it. Dignify it with healing. Dignify it with hope. Dignifying from us. Christmas can be a maze of memories, a maze of emotions. But the real significance, that which will last forever, is our Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done for us. Our passage in Isaiah ends verses 10 and 11. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God. He has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as the garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is what the Savior does, is doing, and still can do in each one of our lives. I, I read this little thing. This woman was in a hurry to get Christmas cards out. She had almost waited too late. She ran into the store, saw a card she liked, got a couple boxes, went home, addressed them as fast as she could, opened each card, signed it, stuck it in the envelope, and put it in the mailbox. Went down to the post office, bought stamps, and mailed them. Then she came back home, relieved she got that done. There were a couple cards left over, and she picked one of them up and opened it and read what it said on the inside. This card is just to say a simple gift is on the way. She had just sent out 22 notices that she was sending people a present. <laughs> Christmas is filled with all kinds of unintended things. But the real meaning of Christmas is very intentional. God acted for us. Would you bow with me as we pray? Lord and Savior, we worship you because you're worthy of our worship. And you call to each one of us by faith to trust in you and your goodness and your mercy. And you will wrap us in the mantle of your righteousness, of your goodness. And we're free forever from the burden of having to try to be good enough. Father, in that freedom, we're set, we are set free and we have the opportunity to help others to be set free. Use us. Lead us. Guide us. May the favorable year of the Lord be among us. In Christ's name, amen.